Hello and welcome to the As Yet Unnamed Podcast podcast. I am your host, Ian Barstow. In this episode of the podcast, we speak to Darren Winter, owner and founder of Juco Digital, a digital marketing company, as well as presenter on the podcast, The Marketing Unplugged. In this wide-ranging interview, we discuss all things social media marketing, as well as the challenges and issues faced with setting up your own business. And we also delve into the world of LGBTQ and what impact that had on Darren's life. It's a really interesting interview and I hope you're going to enjoy it. If you're listening on a podcast app, then you can subscribe. All you need to do is click on that subscribe or follow button and we will appear every single time we release a new episode. If you want to find out more information, you can go to draycottphotography.co.uk forward slash podcast. And we are now on Twitter. Yay! You can now follow us on Twitter at as yet unnamed pod podcast was already taken so i've had to go for pod so yes that's as at yet unnamed pod if you want to follow us on twitter right let's get on with the interview this is darren winter on the as yet unnamed podcast just shouted hello matt but then i realized you couldn't hear me because you got the headphones on so. oh sorry yeah he sat in the corner with his pad bless him <laughs> hello and welcome to this episode of the as yet unnamed podcast i am ian barstow and in today's episode we are joined by a businessman entrepreneur podcaster as well mr darren winter hello darren how are you hi ian how are you i'm doing well thank you Good. That's not what I said off air anyway, because I've got raging temperatures. <laughs> yes, hopefully. Um, we are. What are we? We're the 18th of May. So um, as has been the point for all po- all of my episodes so far, we're in the midst of the uh, COVID lockdown. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very strange time. And, and fingers crossed, it's not what you think it is. <laughs> Let Introduce yourself, Darren. Who are you and what do you do? Wow, I do uh, a lot. My name is Darren Winter. I'm director of a digital marketing business called Duco Digital. So it's D-U-C-O Digital. If I don't spell out the name, people just don't understand it. So there's probably a bit of a marketing um, faux pas already. Um, but um, Lesson 101. Other... Lesson 101, yeah. Don't ever choose that name again. Uh, but yeah, Duco Digital. Uh, so we... Uh, we look after people's websites, we create websites, um, social media campaigns, uh, marketing campaigns, marketing plans, strategies. Um, we do a little bit of designing as well, um, as indeed a lot of other kind of agencies do. Uh, the difference kind of why, why I set this up, which I know you're going to get to that bit. Um, the, the reason why I set this up, I was so fed up with people hearing um, people get overcharged um, for websites and, and designs and social media and um, not just the overcharge, the actual services was rubbish as well. Um, so I come up with this unique formula that actually we can just design, you just pay us for the time to do the website and we just give it back to you. And not only that, then we'll give you the training as well. And we'll make it all really easy. Um, anything you need to do on the website, you'll have a instructional guide how to do it. And it'd be there, even if we go out of business, you know, in 30, 40 years time, if I die or something, um, that it won't matter because the platform it's on will just like pretty much last forever. So that's the kind of formula we come up with. Um, but we just moved into um, online courses, um, which is obviously quite a good time because people are at home at the moment. So it's about upskilling um, into artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, so it's that's really exciting. Um, and also just because it's technology as well, which I'm a, kind of a fan of. Um, but I do the podcasting, uh, so I've got my own show with my colleague, Marcel, who's based in the Netherlands. Um, it's called Marketing Plugged In Podcast. So uh, it's a little bit different format to this, although it's still quite chatty. Um, it's all based around like marketing themes. We go a little bit off tangent, I have to be honest. But it's not too difficult to do if I'm on the podcast. Um, so, but um, it's all men. It's, it's nice chat and uh, it, it, it's, it's quite friendly and informal. And we're going to start doing some YouTube. We've already recorded a couple just in the editing process at the moment. So we're going to go a little bit different. Obviously, digital media now, um, social media, um, podcasts, YouTube, websites, all of that sort of stuff. It's vital for companies to have a presence. Um, yeah. But it's also extremely difficult to get traction um, between 
yourselves and people that you want to target and people that you want to, to get engaged with. Um, without sort of giving away your business secrets, um, yeah. how, how do you go about, so say for example, a company comes to you and they're selling um, video cameras, for example. Yep. How do you go about getting building a, 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 a social media channels for them, and, and how do you get about getting their audience? What sort of the what do you do to to build an audience for a company that comes to you? First of all, there's absolutely no secret in this at all. If anybody says there's secrets, then they're kind of lying. Um, it's it is hard graft, um, but really, in answer to the question, it is starting right from the from the very beginning. I usually start off a conversation like this. Um, I'll have a 20 minute, half an hour conversation and I'll get to know them as as a person because of, it's about relationship building um, and then also about finding out about the business as well. So what's unique about the business? How long they trade you for? What are they known for? What do people say about them? Good and bad. Most of the time it's good. Um, and also kind of what message they want to convey. Who are their customers? So I think this is the biggest thing with marketing is that people forget that actually it's not just what the business wants to portray. It's actually, well, what do you want? What message do you want to send out and who are your customers? So you're there to serve your customers. You're not there to be, you know, the next Coca-Cola and say how great I am. You are there for your customers. So it's about segmenting your audience. So if you're say video cameras, so are you kind of, bottom end, middle end, top end, or kind of maybe a hybrid? Um, are, is it kind of traditional service? So what's your tone of voice? Um, and then all of that kind of, you get, a, I get a quite a good picture. And I always look at from it from, from the consumer point of view. I obviously have to understand it from the business viewpoint, but it's also, I look at the consumer point of view to say, well, do you know, I'd buy that video camera if, if it was about the price, if it's about the value, how easy is it, does it make my life compared to what I've got now? Um, and where can I get it? And what's the support like? What's the service like? Um, who are the people who have already bought it? What are they saying about them? So all these different kind of sides, kind of you can get this persona of the business and try to match then that persona of the consumer, ideally, and get the two to match. And then that kind of you get something traction and engagement and it's a bit like PR public relations that you can't really guarantee anything and now like you've said it's it's, it's even tougher not just because of what's going on in the world but because there's a so many channels b we've only got a very our attention span is actually getting shorter but there's actually more posts going out so and there's a lot more sort of big more flashy headlines so you've got to cut through a lot of the noise so it is much tougher and people think actually the answer is just more content. Um, that can work sometimes in some circumstances, but actually I think it's a bit more about experimentation. It's getting to understand your consumer and it's relating to them. It's about building up a community. That's what's really important because even if you don't get any extra sales, but if you're out there to support your customers, people will buy from other companies or you know, they'll buy on the strength of the word of another consumer to say do you know what they're great because i bought this i only bought the cheap one but whenever they've got a question they always like reply quite quickly companies hate i, I well i always i always think companies hate you bad them on twitter because whenever if ever you've got a complaint don't bother with a phone call if they're on yeah. twitter at them on twitter because they'll soon get back to you of a of a of a tweet because if you if you search him for a company on Twitter you'll see the bad the bad tweets as well as the good tweets, um, yeah. that can be really damaging. And on the other hand, if you've got a really good social media person doing your Twitter account, it can just be really good. So for um, what was the recent one? Was it Yorkshire Tea? Oh York- right, yeah, with the politics. Yeah, Yorkshire Tea with the politics, yeah. and then there was um, there was other ones, that, and they just had really really good comebacks. And it just blows up, and it's the best advertising for them. It's all about how you handle it, and like you say, you, you know, you can come back and you can sound quite defensive, which is obviously the wrong thing. Um, you know, blowing something up in a in a person's face, even though as a business you may well be right, that's always never a good thing to do. You're just adding fuel to the fire, and what you need to do really, if you're in that circum- in that situation, is literally just take two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes if you need to. You can put a holding message out. Thanks very much for making aware of this. 
and we'll come back to you. And if the you know if the comments keep coming in, then you you do need to take it offline. A because not everybody wants to read it. You know if they've got other issues going on, you don't want to you know uh, this kind of exchange in public. It's not professional. Um, I don't think the consumer gets a lot out of that either because it's the to in and the fro in. Some do. That's not to say everybody um, doesn't enjoy it. Some do enjoy that. Um, but I think from the business point of view, it is important to try and deal with it publicly initially, but then try to move it offline as swiftly as possible, but as professionally as possible. And if that means that you do have to put that holding message out, then just do that. And, and, but then do always promise, always follow up on your promises. Don't say to somebody, I'm going to come back to you in half an hour when you can't do that. So how much, so if you, so for example, if, if I was to, if I wanted to promote this podcast and I wanted yeah. to reach, oh, I don't know, I wanted to get 10,000 people to download my podcast. I'm putting yeah. you on the spot a little bit here. Um, and I sort of came to you and I said, right, I want to promote this podcast. I want a big launch or big-ish launch. One listener would be nice. Um, <laughs> you got two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got two. I've got my family, so that's four. So yeah, we'll get there. Um <laughs> So if I wanted to, to promote this and I said to you, I want to run this over two weeks, I want to get as many people as possible, what sort of budget would you think, would you sort of say how, because if, if I spend 20 quid, you're not yeah. going to get much for 20 quid, but if I, no. is it thousands, is it hundreds? I how think much? To, reach a, to reach a big audience, on because that's the thing is, I'm not, I'm not trying to get out of answering the, the question here, but it, to try to explain the rationale is that, you need to look at it when you're budgeting you need to look at it i need to put say probably like a month's worth of like money behind it to really see like like a good campaign and you might want to try a couple of ads out like do a bit of a b testing so which ad works best is it this message in this image or is it that message in this image maybe even more than that um you might have four or five different types of ads going for your audience once you've got an idea of the type of person that you want to target to listen to so then all of those factors need to be put into it let alone everything else so i mean off the top of my head you're probably gonna you're not gonna be able to do it probably very well under a thousand pounds but that's that out of the water then <laughs> but you could still do it you could still do it like for good i'd say you need to be looking at a good five, six hundred quid. You've got to really, because if you think like for when you're spending 10, 20 quid, then your potential size is 50,000. But all it is is that it works out like a an, an auto bidding feature. So then you click through, it might cost you on Facebook. They are quite minimal. So it's the cheapest platform, I think, to, to, um, to uh, advertise on. So it might be like, you know, 20 pence, 30 pence, whatever. But then all of those really add up quite quickly and people will click they're quite click or they'll just spin past um so i don't know when you want quality stuff i'd have to have a look in the back to really work it out for you specifically not i'm not so you probably gonna spend that money but it's just interesting to see what you would have to spend but i would say if advising anybody to do something serious you need to spend a good amount of money really at least do a good month to make sure you get some good results we talked about the the social media side of it um obviously during the last election, it was massive. The the, the social media spend of, of political parties was massive. Um, but you also mentioned earlier you did AI, or you're you're getting into the the AI side of it. Um, I presume that's not Skynet type AI. That's um, <laughs> learning people's <laughs> habits and is it using the voice? So obviously the, the Google um, assistants and the Amazon and the Siri, all of that data, the amount of data they have, or the amount of stuff they get from that must be massive mm -hmm. as well but what's the ai side that you're that you're looking into or you're working on at the moment well we're helping people to understand um if you're looking to build uh, an ai project um or if you have already have a project in mind that you don't know anything about ai and you need to understand the terminology um or if you're just kind of thinking about developing um, a piece of software um you're not going to at the moment we're not kind of showing the coding side but what we are showing you is, is the is the, the main theory, the foundations of how you should approach such a project. And, and then also the um, kind of the implications. There are a lot of moral implications like you've already been talking about. And also kind of the, um, not the programming side, but it's into the kind of the framework. I think it's a good explanation about how to approach it from um, 
from a developer's point of view. So some of the considerations that you need to think about. So it could be that, you know, you might be just developing an app for the iPhone and it wants to, you know, record what a person's saying and then it's going to spew it out and then it's going to go and do some, it's going to search for things on the internet. So let's just say it's something like that. Then it might start off as a home little hobby. But then if it suddenly gets really popular, then that actually opens up lots of kind of issues about kind of um, people might be using the, the app for the wrong reasons and then kind of where that's based and the, the you know the load balancing of terms of the demand meeting the um what they what it can actually deliver so that's kind of the, some of the things that we talk about so it starts off really quite simple in terms of the, the history in the background of um you know alan turing first developed the concept of a chatbot back in the 50s and how that's come on actually now to realization and then where we are about now and the next things coming along so ai is different to automation and it's different to machine learning machine learning is part of ai and it's machine learning that learns the repetitive side of things but the ai is kind of just the which is the brain was um, it microsoft that it was either microsoft or google they had a, a chat bot that they turned on and they just let it develop and, and and learn languages and then just start talking to itself and to, or to another bot or something. And then it got to the point where it was talking a language that it had made up and they had to turn <laughs> it off because <laughs> it had developed so much that it was literally, it was talking, that they could not understand what, they knew that, that the AI was understanding what it was saying and what was coming back, but yeah. they couldn't read it because it had used its own language so they had to pull the plug. Could you imagine? That's like that's crazy. That's scary, isn't it? Yeah, and and that's one. I mean, that just shows the the, the power and you know what 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 it can do. I mean, the, the biggest news stories, but they always give us examples. Is that you know the one of the grandmasters of Go, um, the the Asian sort of game based on chess, or the other way around, I should say. Um, it's it's you know, a human taught the machine how to play. Then the machine learnt that, and then actually beat the human player at the end. So it's like wow, and the fact that he did it so quickly um, and even effortlessly um, that gave a lot of people, you know, wow, this is amazing. And also, you know, a lot of concerns as well about actually how quickly it was actually learning. That's because technology is improving all of all of the time. Um, but that's why it's really important that even at the kind of base level, it is really important to understand the moral implications about what you're doing and understanding that you're doing this for good technology is for good is not to like you kind of um, alluded to at the beginning where it's actually been used for bad um and it's a real shame because it's given it a bit of a it, a really bad name um and people are worried about kind of using facial recognition out on the high street but there are a, a lot of really good use cases a lot of good arguments to say this is really going to help society society because as a society, we now we're kind of running out of resources in terms of manpower is so expensive. We haven't got the people to go out and do a lot of these things for us that we used to, but we have got the technology to do it. But of course, then technology can also be developed for, for bad or can be taken advantage of. I mean, it kind of, I'm not too sure really the AI is in this, but certainly kind of the, the talk at the moment is about the, the use of the, the app for trying to measure people about, you know, if they've got the coronavirus or not. And there is a certain amount of AI in because it will tend to make decisions about like, yes, you met that person. So therefore, you know, they need to send you a warning. Um, and then how some of that, it's more about the data that you alluded to in terms of data management and how that's going to be used, where it's going to be stored and who can access it. And we all know people make mistakes. Um, Particularly government. And, <laughs> yes, yeah, it happens. It happens in history, um, and it is probably likely to happen again. Um, so you, people do have to be careful. And you know, I'm one of these people who goes to websites and I'll just tick all the boxes. I really don't care. But actually, when it comes to the app this time, I'm definitely much more. Yeah, you know, I don't really want to get involved. I do the current COVID one. Let's move on then. So let's uh, let's get personal. We're at this part of the conversation when we talk about your life. Um, so, uh, where are you? Um, where are you born? Where are you? Where are you born and bred? Um, born in Maidstone in Kent uh, in 1974. Old, old man. 
I know, definitely <laughs> the, old, the older side now. <laughs> it's like I, someone I work with, um, they were born in the 2000s. <laughs> It's mad, isn't it, to think about that? It's like, oh, like, what was I doing? It's like, wow. Just shut up and go away. <laughs> I was left school when you weren't even, you weren't even born when I left school. Well, just shut up. Um, so, uh, Mason Kent, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, school, college. Did you go to university? I did. I've, I moved. Um, I've, I've lived around different parts of the UK. Um, so, we were just talking off air, weren't we? So, 2012, I left the Midlands, left... Worcestershire and uh, moved up to the <laughs> northeast. <laughs> <laughs> moved up to the northeast and went to Teesside Uni, did a computing degree and uh, graduated 2015. Um, and then did a master's in international marketing and cross cultural communication. And that was part time, graduated in 2017. So all the higher education I've done a lot later in life. I didn't really have the opportunity when I was younger because uh, my dad left home so I decided uh, I did my A-levels did my GCSE was great A-levels like kind of giving up halfway I didn't do amazing um, well but I had a really good job to go into so I worked for Morrison's um, for five years and I got my first manager's job working for them um, I was said, it I'm Morrison's really or Safeway work. but I was Safeway uh, but it was Morrison's when I joined yeah, okay. um, but I think it was just after the, the merger Um but yeah, that's when Kevin Morrison was alive, and um, and I think it was different. It was a different type of retail then. Um, it probably yourself, you, it's just different then. I think people you didn't have the internet really because um, the internet really happened. The internet was around, but really it started in two thousand and seven when people got iPhones and people using that type of stuff. See, I remember when um, I worked at Safeway. Um, if you ever go in, you've got the scan, shop and scan devices. Yeah. Um, we were one of the test shops in Safeway for the shop and scan devices, and that was back in 1998. So wow. we had it for about three years, and then they realised that people just nick stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they got very sophisticated at just building the trolleys out with bigger <laughs> items and putting expensive booze in there. Um, so they took it out. But yeah, that was back in probably in about 98, and then it disappeared for 10, 12 years, and now it's starting to come back again. Um but yeah, there was That's no... That's amazing, isn't it? That they were so... F- that technology was then. They would like kind of see in the future at that, that stage. Yeah, and the only difference is now the devices have a better screen. The actual... It was one of the... It used to be one of the old like dot matrix screens. Um, but the actual technology is exactly the same. You just scan your barcodes as you go around and then you scan it and it puts it up on the till. But yeah, that must have been... It, it must have been 98... About 98 to 2000 that we had that at, at the Safeway in Redditch as a, as a test one. So yeah, um, yes. Yeah, well, just before you can like move on, it's that I just wanted to say kind of that you're saying um this the, the, the scanning going, people like kind of like um sort of seeing things. Obviously there's a whole thing in the Guardian um last year. People I think people were amazed and shocked um and surprised that people were like weighing um what's it? Brussels swelts and then putting on bottles of vodka at the um, self-scan items. It's like, really? We really just got to understand this is happening? This has been happening for ages. <laughs> you really don't get this now. It's like, how stupid are you? Well, the oh, thing is, though, when, just... when people did it, because we could see, um, we could obviously see what was coming through and you could look at the trolley. But you just sort of say to them, well, we need to check it. We need to check your shopping. Um, yeah. And then it would be like, you scan 25 quids worth and it's 125 and they go, oh, must have been a dodgy device. Couldn't do anything because they hadn't left the store, so they didn't. They'd not stolen anything, but you yeah. knew damn well what they were doing. Um, <laughs> it was just, it was amazing. So I think, yeah, it disappeared for a while, but now it's obviously in in every shop. Um, yeah, and it's yeah, it it is strange how it how it's changed. So, so you went to Morrison's, um, and then what was after that? So, how long were you there uh, for? Five years was that? Yeah, I did five years, and then um, I went to work for a, photograph- a photography firm, um, which was um, where people bring in their reels of film. That, now, this makes me feel old, <laughs> where people used to bring in their film out their cameras, and we send it off to get printed. Wow, how and, old is and that? Now it's, and now that's retro chic. <laughs> I, absolutely. We'll probably go open that again and charge triple the price. Um, that was really good business, actually, working for, it was working for Max Spielman, 
um, which was a kind of German name. He was the real, it was a name of a real person, but um, yeah. So, the, but they had like hundreds of shops. Um, Did you closely examine some of the photos? <laughs> yeah, we, do you know? <laughs> wow, there's some stories there to tell. I've forgotten all about that. <laughs> yeah, there's some interesting photos. I never really had really no, like really proper dodgy ones you know things like you need to call the police about um i've heard stories of that happening but uh, we kind of come across the other ones and part of the customer service was when people used to Put show the stickers the on yeah and it's like oh wow God, show them that it's like well no that's part of the thing gonna show them like, yes those are the ones madam <laughs> there's your dodgy <laughs> afternoon pictures what were you doing there <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just my hand I've got a big thumb <laughs> <laughs> I've examined that closely it's not a thumb <laughs> <laughs> so um, oh. so obviously you're um, we'll, we'll come back to your career in, in, a, in a bit but you're um, married partner 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 you're not married yet no, um, we now can. In, you know, we can, don't you? You know, it's legal. We now. can, we can. <laughs> but it, it, it's like, I was it back in two thousand five. I'd been to Australia for about six weeks, or, no, about five weeks. I was working. I was still working in retail then, and I was working in Birmingham at the time. And uh, I kind of one of these lifetime things. I wanted to go away and do a trip. It was completely on my own, so I decided to go to Australia. So I was in my kind of mid to late 20s I suppose I hadn't really done a lot in kind of life so I thought do you know what I really want to do that I've met I've been working for um, a Japanese fashion chain in London um, and so she said oh come across and stay with me so I said are you sure she's like yeah so she lived in Perth so I went across and um, stayed with her um, just for about a week week and a half something like that and then I just booked uh these like kind of um, long distance coaches and just slept overnight on the coaches and um, stayed in youth hostels along up and down the coast. And anybody who's been like to Western Australia um, or even just Australia, I mean, obviously it's vast, um, but it's the first time you've been properly traveling on your own. Um, it's just such an, it was such an amazing experience. Um, and I kind of, it was a really good chance for me to decide actually, do you know what? I really want to sort out what I wanted out of life and what um, I didn't want in life. And come back, I was a lot more focused. I mean, in a few months, I kind of missed somebody on the trip to share that experience with. Um, I met a lot. I really did meet a lot of people on the way, people from all over the world. And we did like going out fishing for pearls out in the sea and swinging from trees and like cooking um, strange concoctions. Not the chandeliers, no, you were swinging from the chandeliers. And not swinging from the chandeliers. <laughs> it was such an amazing trip and I think it was really just for me at that time, it really kind of helped say, well, actually, I don't want any more of this in my life. I want more of that. <clears throat> so I came back and a few months later, um, I went through a bit of a dating period and then I'm just about to give up and then... Um, and then I'm, I met my partner Matt, and then we've been uh, together like kind of ever since. Um, and yeah, we do we do get on really really well. We're very um, we're very different people in some respects, and also very similar in, in other um, respects as well. Um, but we've done a lot together within the last um, twelve years. And he's, I have to say, been what did I say? Twelve years? No, it's longer than that, isn't it? Fifteen years. Um, Shame you don't know what, how long I know. it is. It's like, it's, gosh, it's, time goes so quick. It's really, it does, doesn't it? It, it, it is. And somebody was saying the other day, I was listening to the radio, and they were saying that as each year goes on, as you get a bit older, it actually it feels like it's going quicker. It doesn't feel like that sometimes day to day. You're thinking, oh, God, I can't wait to get the end of today. But actually, when you look back over the last couple of years, you think, wow, so, I've done so Do, much. Doesn't it make you feel older, though? Because you think, we said, yeah, we said, on, on Saturday it's like oh it's halfway through May already where's this year going and I'm <laughs> yeah. thinking yeah. that is exactly what my mum and dad used to say when I was a child and it's like it's just like but it is so true it just flies by obviously as a, a gamer myself um, I, I always find it interesting talking to people that have gone through the experience um, so how did you when did you sort of come to terms or when did you realise yourself that you were a, a gay a gay person um, and and how long did it take you to sort of realize and accept that on, in yourself that this is who you were? I, did you find I it difficult, I, or was it a fairly easy journey for you? 
I think I knew from a very young age. I can't really remember because I think I told myself that perhaps I, I knew that I was different, but I didn't really understand. I just didn't really, generally didn't understand what that actually meant. Um, and so I think I kind of like buried and hid it a little bit, but people, other people kind of were aware of it and I just decided to ignore it um, or just be kind of a, a victim of it, I suppose. Um, and then I suppose it really wasn't until I sort of, once once school had finished or yeah, A levels had finished, I was working, and then I think I got into my early twenties. So quite, I don't know if there is a, a a good age or the right age, but you know I suppose like from from a younger point of view, twenty one, twenty two, I think. So I told my mum; she was the first person that I told. Isn't it always? Um, yeah, <laughs> it is. It's anyway. like, and it was like. Oh right, okay. <laughs> it was like, uh. in fact, I think I had told somebody at work, maybe, and then, but I think it was roughly at the same time I told them as well because I wanted her to know. I didn't want. I felt bad if I hadn't told her. Um, and also, I think when I kind of gone to like the next stage, I was able to. Well, what do I do now? Or kind of work that bit out as well. So I was going to go out and try and meet some people, um, not to do anything. Um, and that doesn't sound defensive. It's just that. I just wanted to understand more about kind of what that meant, I suppose. Um, well, it's such a, I liked. it's such a, it's a big thing. And then once it's out there, it's not a big thing for most people. Most yeah. thankfully now, most people are, it's that process is, is, is easier. Um, but that first, the first time you ever go to a gay club or the first time you ever around other gay people, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're with yeah. the gays. Um, it is. It's like a proper. It's like, oh my god, because it's such a it's such a culture in itself, and there are so many facets of who you are, um, who you like, um, what category do you fit in? Are you this? Are you that? Are you something else? Yeah. Um, did you find it difficult navigating that, or did you? Were you were you a sort of going out clubbing person, or were you a stay at home person, or definitely stay at home person? And then I registered on Gaydar. I don't even know if it exists anymore. Um, it does. Gaydar. It does. It does exist. Does it? Yeah. For the for the younger people listening, Gaydar was before Grinder. <laughs> and it's like you're right. And it, it was all about categories. I. Are you this? Are you that? Are you this? What do you like? Do you like this? Do you like do you like that? You need to have your profile pics, and obviously, we all know the type of pics that still exist and were <laughs> definitely in a thing then. At that time, I so when that wow, well, was going that's going back. Well, it must be around the two. I can't quite remember the year, but let's say it was around about the two thousand time. But it was very judgy. And I don't know what it's like now, but at that point it was very judgy, mm. and some of the messages were, were very judgy. If you if you were going to get any at all, I was I was about to say I've only really got confidence to go into gay nightclubs now, which is quite interesting. To kind of I I think also because I had been like quite busy just doing everything else I've been like doing through life, or been lucky enough to do. Um, uh, but I've only really kind of got to that point and actually now I want to do more out of it. Interestingly enough, I don't know if I should say this or not. I can, I can, this is true. So within the last year, I've been called more bad gay stuff than I've ever been in my life. Really? In, yeah, in public as well. Um, and as a couple separately. Um, I don't think it's just the area that I live in, not um, sort of locality in terms of the kind of the roads or stuff like that i mean like kind of the area of the country because people could argue that i do generally think that i think we are that some of us are kind of you know there is a divide as much oh. as we like to think everybody's in unity it's it, i i completely agree i think it's i think yeah. we're we're moving we've gained so much yeah and, and i think the the legal stuff so, so the rights the marriage i think it would be I don't think we're anywhere close to losing that. I no. do think, however, people now with social media and, and in person are more, they feel more entitled to say something to you because, yeah. which, is, which is so bad. And would you go, would you walk down the street holding the person that you've been with, the person that you love with, the person you've been with for the last 12 days? Would you, what would you, would you and do you walk down the street holding hands? 
I would. It's interesting. We did this was Saturday, and we we're walking down. We live quite close to the beach, and I wanted to, and then Matt said no, he didn't want it, and it's like so. I've just played over, just messed around with him. So like, no, no, and I think there's some of it's personality because some people are more confident or not confident about that, and that's each their own, and that's fair enough. Me doesn't bother me, and I don't care if anybody come up to me and like even just shouted at me in my front in my face. That that's fine. I think the difficulty is now is that it just doesn't stay at that point anymore. So even I was quite shocked when I got things, you know, shouted at me from people's cars and stuff, and I was just walking down the road. Um, but I think the worry is now actually just just doesn't stop there. There's more, and perhaps these are horror stories and just the one-offs. But you, they do get highlighted a lot more now in the media about kind of other things that have happened, and it does. It should be a worry for all of us. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it should be a concern about the direction that society is going. And like you say, people do feel more entitled. I do blame social media, even though I work in social media. <laughs> I do blame it because it has given a, you know, the soapbox for people to say what they want, but they just don't understand what they're saying. They don't understand the implications or it's almost like they can say whatever they want and then they can just ditch it and walk off. It's like, well, actually... You, you shouldn't do that because that is somebody that you're talking to is a real person or about somebody and you need to understand that but I, you can't do that on digital either so there, there's lots of problems about what happens with this see because homo, homophobic homophobic crime is rising um, yeah there's, there's more and more reports of homophobic crime um and and you sort of think i, I think I, i'm i don't want to bring brexit into it but it's that whole Yep. That whole them agree. us, it, it's, it's yep. the them us thing, it's the, the left right, the right seems to be more right than it used to be, um, mm-hmm. it's the religion side of it, it's the, the use of religious religious rhetoric and religious teachings um, that sort of still enforce and people still get away with enforcing that being gay, being bi, being trans, being whatever is wrong, Yeah, and it's and if and people don't the media and, and politicians don't seem willing to to stand up for it or to stand up towards it and say, Do you know what, actually no, we're gonna stop this. And I think yeah. social media are getting better but aren't quick enough. Yeah. I don't think they're quick enough at yes, I'm all for human for, for freedom of speech, but when you you're peddling hatred, I don't think an open platform is a place for you at all. If you want to talk yeah. about it, go and find someone on the dirt and darky, dirt, dark and dirty, dark and dirty, dark and dirty <laughs> web, and talk yeah. about it there. But if you're on an open platform, if you're basically being homophobic or abusing somebody, kick them off. Yeah, and and I do think there's a good argument for saying if you're registering for social media, you have to give us your details, because I think that would stop a lot of people because people are very keyboard warrior you don't know who i am but if they suddenly yeah. said well we do know who you are where you live and all your details and pass that on to the police yeah i agree i think they, they definitely i think for its own sake because i think there is a danger if it carries on this way then it's almost gonna i don't know how it would happen but it would kind of implode it kill itself the platform will just full be so much of hatred then actually people will just move away altogether. Me as well, I just wouldn't even do it as a business. Just, you know, I've even contemplated what that even might look in five or six years time, that actually, if it does carry on at these levels, it's not actually good for business to be even on the platform anymore. I guess you've got loads of people, but you don't want to be there because the people that are on there are so bad. You wouldn't want them as your customers, even if they got, you know, a million pounds to spend in your business, you wouldn't want them. Do you you Um, think we're we're in danger of being in echo chambers because i i remember when the last election um if i when i looked at my twitter feed on election day i was like oh my god i think labor could actually do it and then because obviously everyone you follow on twitter is people that you're interested in so you get that massive echo yeah. chamber um and everything is bigger on on twitter everything is is very polarized there's whichever debate you want to look at x factor Britain's got talent. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. It's just so dividing. Um, do you think we? Do you think we'll get to the point where we'll suddenly be more and more people will detox from from Twitter, Instagram, and the negative? Because obviously the body issues that 
Instagram can have, the body issues TikTok can have, all that sort of stuff. Do you think we'll, we'll get to the point where actually <clears throat> it might be quite good if the phones all died for 24 hours once a month or something? Yeah, I think I can see that happening. I think, I mean, there's a lot... we, As a society at the moment, we are being forced to talk more about mental health, whether we like it or not. And I know that this week is mental health week. This is going out a lot later in the year. But um, there are a lot more of these mental health days, mental health awareness weeks. Excuse the... Uh, Excuse the background, bing bong. <laughs> we'll do that again. So who's at the moment, it's mental health. We ruined your week. house this time of night. <laughs> How dare they? I know. I know. Crazy time. <laughs> um, so we, we are talking more about mental health, and I, I think that there is enough research, <clears throat> definitely, to say that there are issues around social media um, and young people. Um, I do think we're going to hear a lot more digital detoxes and digital sickness. Um, I, even for myself, I'm doing you know, 10, 11 hours a day on the computer. Some people do work in longer than that. Um, and this kind of fear of missing out on socials and having to keep everything monitored that puts a lot of incredible stress um, on your brain and on your body. Um, so we're just keeping up. Um, so I agree. I think we will see a lot more of these kind of trying to opt out days, retreats. Maybe that's maybe the next thing to get into, me and you. So you said earlier that you were you'd not really done the the gay scene much, the clubs and et cetera, et cetera. What was it like the first time you actually went into a did you think, Oh my the, god, what am I doing? Or was it like, Oh my god, this is amazing? I you know, I can still visual I was working in the mailbox. So um so that would have been Ooh, gosh, I'm just trying to think. When that was a mailbox is a um, is or currently still is um, an upmarket kind of like shopping plaza in Birmingham. Yeah, um, changed a little bit. And I think that like, since originally when it was like built, um, but I was working in there, and then somebody said, "Oh, you need to, you need to come along." I'm sure that's when I went. So I went, "Ah, oh, okay then." And then they were uh, they were gay. Um, but we're just going along just as, as, as friends like together and then i went and i kind of um it was obviously just like really ma- it, i can't even remember the place on her street obviously which is the one of the gay part of the gay area of, of the birmingham city um and i'm i think i think i kind of it was okay um I don't think it was in there too long. I think it was also that was that was a time when everybody was really into heavily heavily drinking um and I've just never really been that type of person where I, I mean, I did drink a lot when I was much younger, when I was 18, 19 year old, and I did all of that. But I got it out of my system quite quickly. So then when I get to that, it's like, oh, it's like, yeah, I've kind of got past that bit. But then kind of seeing go go dancers and the music pumping and stuff like that. I like that side of it. And I actually still continue to do that. I do my own, I, I do my own electronic music. I, do <laughs> I thought you said you were going to do, you do your own go go dancing. <laughs> well, do you know what? <laughs> I, I love the last few Fridays we've defected in Glitterbox on YouTube and it's like, you know, it's Friday afternoon, like four o'clock. It's like, you know what, I'm going to have a, have a cup of tea and have a little dance around the room. <laughs> um, but I love it. I, I think I love the energy and the passion, uh, the energy in, um, of the of the electronic music. And I think you, I get such a buzz out of that. So I love that side of it. Um, but then I hated what I was saying beforehand with gay dark. Um, which was kind of all the judgment and stuff like that. And um, I hope that it's still not the case. It will always be that kind of, because society is all about judging each other anyway. But I think there was just so much of it then. You need to look like this. You need to be this way. You need to be that. Um, I t- just hopefully that isn't still the biggest message to go to. I don't think it is anymore from what I could tell. I do read a lot more the gay magazines and stuff like that than I've ever used to. And it doesn't seem to be that way. Um, but it's difficult to tell. Um, but the last couple of years, I've been I've, I've been to Barcelona twice last year, and then the year before, I've gone out just to like a couple of clubs and bars, and, and it's so different to here. Really, 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 di- yeah, so different. Um, even to I went into one of the um, gay stores, um, and the people just come up to you and just talk. I mean, I'd never met them before, um, and they were just very casual. And yeah, I suppose they try and get you to maybe to look and buy things and that. I just don't think it was their aim. It was just about, you know, it's like 
just here friendly to where you're from or sort of stuff and well we recommend other places to go and then we actually went somewhere they never told us to go which was a cafe just opposite on the corner in the square and then they, they actually came they shut up shop and like 20 minutes later they kind of come in it's like oh it's really good to see you. it's like you come to here and we only just opened and this is part of what we do and it was it was like it wasn't too busy but it was just it was so nice and they come to the sat down and just chat to you just just treat you as you are and it is really refreshing um i still think in this country maybe it's about who you associate and who you work with and not saying it's a bad thing but people like you say like yourself talking about this tonight is actually just nice people don't talk about that type of, the, of kind of like it's, it's really weird we can't ask them about that in case you get a bit, gets a bit upset why would you get upset I know some, again some people might do but I don't think the majority would do As it, for me it is quite nice just talking about it but it also makes you feel then accepted as part of everybody else even though you might think you are anyway it's still quite nice to know that you are still part of everybody else and um so what was your first like, what was your first um because obviously mainstream media when i was teens early 20s um mm. having a gay character on tv wasn't really seen and then we had queer as folk Oh yeah, and that was that? just like a bang straight in, straight in your face. This is what it is. Um, yeah, is there a thing on on sort of on television? Was there someone on television that you looked at that was either not a gay character or a gay character that you suddenly you thought was helped you develop? No, not really. I think interestingly, the when, which year was that? Was it? That was before 2000, wasn't it? Queer as Folk. Queer as Folk. Yeah, it's 25, 25 years ago. So that may be, I'm just trying to think, I might not have even been out at that point. So that Oh, I, I wasn't. Been... It was late night. It was TV down low on TV, <laughs> on the TV yeah, in my yeah. bedroom for definite. Yeah. Because that was like you say, it was, that was a really massive thing, wasn't it? And it was yeah. all over the media, but also there was... You know, imagine imagine if you had social media back then, are they out you know outlash from people's like saying you shouldn't have this on? That's when Channel Four was really a lot more risque and yes. and sending like things out, and that's what it was good for at that time. And I think it's kind of lost its way a little bit now. Um, so I would have been, I would have felt quite embarrassed, I think, to to feel that I could identify with everything in that series, but actually not telling anybody because that wasn't. Yeah, there the, the just wasn't the accepted, or you didn't feel that was the accepted thing to do. Um, but I don't really think of, a, I can't really think of anybody as a character. What about yourself? Um, Good question. It probably was Queer as Folk. I think that was the first time that I'd seen gay people just as normal people, rather than being yeah. the the outlandish Julian Carey Paul, uh, Lily Savage, Graham Norton at the time was a lot more out there and outlandish. Um, I think that first program, the, the Queer as Folk, I think I was in that generation where that was just, it was like, oh my God, that's what that's what you can be. You're not going to be the sad, lonely person that everyone told you you're going to be. You could have a, an amazing life. It never was mm. that amazing. I never got with Charlie Hume, Humer, Hume, whatever his name is, the main, the, the young star of it. Is, you know, that never <laughs> happened. But yeah, um, it did definitely, it, it was... It was an eye opener. That's for, that's for certain. It was before the internet came out, and you could watch anything and everything you wanted to. Yeah, it certainly um, it gave people a bit more of a shock in terms of. But it, for me, it's like, well, I looked at it and it's like, well, what's the difference between people? You know, kind of all ordinary couples that they, some people still do that. It's just because it was just put, you know, men put in the same positions um, rather than just women and men. And it's like, well, that's really awful. You can't do that. And it's like, does this really go on? It's like, well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> it but probably then there was does. Still, I, see, I, 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 I think we haven't... I think we haven't moved on as much as we think we have sometimes because I think yeah. that undercurrent is still there. So when um, Dancing on Ice... I don't watch Dancing on Ice, but Ian Watkins from um, H from Steps was the first male, male and male couple... And they had 300, and I know it's only 300 out of a million, out of 6 million people or whatever it was, but they still had 300 people that wrote in and complained saying this shouldn't be on our TV. And you think, it's 2020, are you still thinking that? Yeah. 
it's it's a long three, it's a long way to go and 300 people usually would trigger some sort of a um an apology or response yeah in off, kind of off, recent years combined offcom sort of said bugger off <laughs> and, and itv yeah. went bugger off as well which i think is, is really good of them and i think i don't know if you want or not actually but it's still you wouldn't think now in 2020 two men dancing on tv together would be such a major thing but we seem to be at that point again i don't yeah and, and uh, i know we won't go through, but i still i don't understand why people are so uh, upset about it or kind of how it really affects them like individually i think what's interesting kind of um looking at things like netflix um and uh well mainly netflix they, they've got a lot more kind of trans stuff out with yes like, pose well actually bbc did it and then they moved it kind of across which i think is a brilliant tv series probably one of the best things i've ever actually kind of watched in recent years um i really enjoy a great storyline but also the characters just just so just like and yeah just they're great and but they're also true people um and billy porter and yeah yeah it is but everything about that tv series is great but there's a lot more of that now going on so it's almost it's gone beyond the gay message and it's for actually now that it feels that it should be accepted and now we've moved to kind of the trans message which is almost the people who've got if you had an issue with being gay of people being gay you'll definitely have an issue with this um and it's now trying to bit that into this kind of accepted um like arena um which i kind of like helps the overall family i suppose to like See, i think today the problem is as well that, that a lot of if you read the um the queer press and attitude and stuff like that they do a lot for for trans people but you hear a lot of gay men and gay women or uh, uh, against trans people and you think that just it it just amazes me so i i we use, I, I i think you may have left the radio station by the time but we had a um uh, two transgender women um who joined the show joined the radio show um yeah and, and were you there for that? I can't... Yes. You were, yeah, weren't yeah. you? Yeah, you were, yeah. 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 Um, and, and I remember and I remember her coming in and saying to me, she would walk around the town centre in Redditch and people would... She had no idea they were in the middle of the town centre. They'd start shouting at her, abusing her. And I just think... I don't know if it's because... It, I, I, I just find it unbelievable that people are that concerned with somebody that is going through something that is a massive trauma... And a massive yeah. stress um, in their life, and they feel the need to go up to them and tell them how disgusted they are with them, and how it's unnatural, yeah. and how you're born a man or a woman. Well, not necessarily. You're it, if you don't feel right in your body, you should have the right to go and do that. And I do think trans. I think people seem to think they've lost the fight with bashing down the gay people, so they're now going to move on to the transgender people, and that's the next fight. We've yeah. had the racist and we've had the homophobia. Now it's transphobia. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I think it's almost. It feels like certainly in the media, um, said with like the the big streaming giants, um, that this is is now they're bringing that forward for you know for acceptance. And also, I think it does help. I think it does help the case to for people to understand and and accept those people because if they can accept them on the screen, perhaps they can. It makes it easy to accept those people in real life. I think there is that the East is like the East Enders effect, I suppose. Um, people kind of watch it for different reasons, but generally the issues they raise there are issues of of that of kind of what's going on in society to talk it through, to rationalise stuff. So if kind of that happens, that's a really great thing. But like you say, I, I, for I mean, I can't imagine going back into the seventies and the sixties. You know, when you if you were either men or women having um, going out and trying to hold hands or going out to clubs or whatever and just being found um by police or you know things people of that time what that was like and the confidence to do that I mean, now modern day times fast forward and you know it's for trans people you know on more of a, a bigger platform going out it takes some guts to go out just to be who, who you want to be but then for somebody to actually go up to you and like you say say exactly what they think of you Wow, gosh, yeah, I think it's uh, really shocking. Yeah, I see. If you don't, if you, you might not agree with it, you might not like it. Keep it to yourself. 
Yeah, Don't absolutely. Don't go abusing people because they're yeah. not what you think they should be. So, quick fire questions. Yep. Quick fire answers. I'm thinking of these off the top of my head because I've just thought we'll try this. Um, so, favourite music? Uh, techno music at the moment. Pretty much anything. Do you know, every time I think of techno music, I'm going to go off the quick answer bit now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. So, obviously, my, my music is late 90s early 2000s so it was when yeah it's when dance music was decent um <laughs> yes yeah um, I, no i'll go i'll agree with that <laughs> and i just think when we're old and 70 80 90 and we're in a in a nursing home at the moment if you're in a nursing home they're playing um vera lynn and, and um, all that sort of stuff we'll be all sat there in those big high chairs that you always see in, in nursing homes and firestarter will come on or prodigy or um uh, or slim but yeah or sonic or whatever um <laughs> and we'll all be sat there and we're going like june ah! <laughs> we'll be raving you know, away we, radio tune you, you start hearing some of that stuff as i have to say i'm a bit of a listen to six music um they but he's quite eclectic the mix and they so you could have hard rock one second which is not i'm definitely not into that uh, but then it's mixed up with a bit of um, kind of like rave and and all something a bit more contemporary. Um, so he's quite he's a bit of a mixed bag of everything. Um, for him, but he's, he's just he's very well put together. So definitely definitely a bit of a six music fan. It's when BBC Radio, it's when Radio Two do the um, sound of the nineties. So they've got sound of the sixties, seventies, eighties, and now nineties. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> Won't be long, Radio 2, Sunday <laughs> afternoon, playing your old golden favourites. <laughs> you remember when? Gold Radio will have um, hardcore dance hour instead of the night, instead of the Beatles hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, just, it's, it's like with now, because like vinyl's coming back in, well, he's back in now in style and like CDs are out and like downloads are like for the masses and well, I, I love all that kind of... I don't get vinyl, it's so expensive. Darren, thank you very much for joining me today on the As Yet Unnamed podcast. Um, do you want to give yourself a quick plug? Your marketing company, how do we find out about you? Oh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, you can go to www.ducodigital.com. Um, if you like podcasts, uh, listen to the Marketing marketing Plugged In podcast. We'll get you as a guest on there as well, Ian, sort of shortly once we get ourselves sorted out. Um, but yeah, kind of follow us on the socials, look for us on Twitter. That's probably kind of where we live. Um, but yeah, it's been great. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. Um, so yeah, this has been the As Yet Unnamed podcast. I am Ian Barstow. Thank you very much to Darren Winter for joining us today. And we will be back next Monday with another episode of this brand new podcast. That's it. Another episode of the As Yet Unnamed podcast podcast is done. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Darren. I found it really interesting and it's really good to speak to him again. If you want to find out more about his company, you can go to ducodigital.com. That's D-U-C-O digital.com. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast and you want to hear more, then you can follow and subscribe to us on any of the podcast apps you are listening to at the moment. We are on Apple, Google, Spotify, all of the main ones, so please do click on that subscribe button. And if you're listening to us on Apple, then why not give us a review? It really does help. You can find out more about the show, dracotphotography.co.uk forward slash podcast, and you can follow us on Twitter as well. It's at as yet unnamed pod. P-O-D. Yeah, I'm still gutted they had someone else have the podcast. It's very annoying. Uh, you can follow me directly on Twitter as well, at Ian HRP, and the same for Instagram as well. And if you're listening and watching on YouTube, thank you very much for sticking around and watching the whole episode. And you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. And you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Ian HRP. So until the next episode of the As Yet Unnamed podcast podcast, I am Ian Barstow. Thank you so much for listening and bye for now. Bye.